Hey everyone, this is lecture 2.1, The Basics of Research. Uh, we are continuing our Crime, Public Policy, and Criminal Justice System course. Um, today we will talk about research and policy as found in chapter 2. Uh, this lecture specifically is talking about what exactly research is, which might be something that you don't know that you actually don't know, and then we're going to talk about what happens when research gets political. Uh, before I really get going, I want to note that I am, uh, you might have noticed uh, a few parts of these lectures are a little bit um, shaky looking. Uh, it's because I'm using new software. Uh, hopefully this software will improve uh, relatively quickly. So let's first talk about what exactly research is. Um, so our society has a problem with scientific literacy. Uh, it's, uh, it's a big problem for our society. And part of the problem is that scientists, including social scientists like me, use common words in different ways than non-scientists. So these words include research, theory, and also the term hypothesis. Uh, you probably talk about hypotheses relatively frequently, but um, it's not probably a word you use that much. And that's part of this problem. And I'm gonna talk about each of these three terms individually now. Research is uh, commonly talked about as something you do to find something that you don't know, but somebody else knows, right? So for example, you might be talking to a friend of yours and you not, don't know what the capital of Iran is, and then you look it up on Google, and it's like, oh, look, there, it's Tehran, right? That's the capital city of Iran. That, in scientific terms, is not research. That's just looking something up. The scientific definition of research is to find new information that nobody knows, right? That, that you can't just look up because nobody knows it. Right. So to, if you would conduct a survey to determine how many immigrants from Iran are living in your city, that would be social scientific research, because it may very well be that nobody has counted exactly how many um, people from Iran or Tehran uh, are living in your specific city. That is scientific research, right? It's creating new information nobody else knows. Um, a, a, another example from the natural sciences could be something like finding photographs of, or not finding photographs, taking photographs of an undiscovered planet, right? That is scientific research. It is producing something new that nobody has ever seen before. You couldn't, before those photographs were taken, you couldn't just look up a picture of what that planet looked like on, on the internet because it didn't exist before. That's what we mean in science when we talk about research. Another word that we have a problem with in our language is the word theory. Uh, the common definition of theory that you might have said earlier today, I hear scientists even use it like this, is an idea that you have about something. So for example, you have a theory that if you buy your mother a present, she will stop being angry at you. That is what scientists will call a hypothesis. A scientist uses the word theory to mean something that we are absolutely certain about. And that's very confusing, right? The fact that scientists, when we say theory, we are talking about a piece of scientific knowledge that we have overwhelming evidence for, right? It is scientific theory that we are on the third planet from our sun, the earth, right? It, it, the law of gravity is scientific theory. Evolution via natural selection is scientific theory. That means that we are absolutely certain about it. We know these things. These are things that are very well established. Now, that's not to say there isn't still more to learn about it, that the exact mechanics of gravity 
uh, we may figure that out in a more defined way over the next couple hundred years. Or there might be elements of natural selection that we were unaware of maybe deep in our DNA or something along those lines. But those components are in fact absolute or as absolute as scientists are willing to say because that's how we are. Now, the word tying this together that keeps you probably using the theor word theory wrong is the word hypothesis. There is no commonly used word for hypothesis because hypothesis is what you mean when you're commonly saying theory. So a hypothesis, by the scientific definition, is an educated guess about how you think the world works. So for example, here's your hypothesis. If you study for 12 hours, you will get an A on the exam, right? So you have an idea on how studying will impact your grade. That is a hypothesis, it's a scientific guess. And each hypothesis is made up of an independent variable and a dependent variable. So let's look at your hypothesis. If you study for 12 hours is an independent variable. This is a variable that exists on its own and this is the variable causes change. Studying for 12 hours will cause a result. The result will be that you will get an A on the, the exam. That is the dependent variable, right? So 12 hours causes A. Uh, a dependent variable is a variable that is dependent on the other and change in the independent variable causes a change in the if you only study for one hour, you will get a C, right? Uh, if you up the number of hours that you study, you will get a different result. And that's what that is. And those sound like relatively simple concepts, but that's the basis of all science, pretty much. Um, and the fact that we don't, it, it frustrates me that we don't break this down to like elementary school kids. Uh, because I think we'd be better off as a society. So, uh, more stuff relating to research in this course specifically, uh, there are some agencies that produce the bulk of scientific knowledge uh, regarding law uh, criminal justice. So, uh, the Law Enforcement Assistant Agency, LEAA, is an agency within the National Institute for Law Enforcement and Criminal Justice and it provides uh, law enforcement agencies with information and grants to uh, improve public safety. Another organization is the National Institute of Justice. Uh, this was created to advance scientific research, development, and evaluation to enhance and administer it, administrate justice and public safety. And they do this by, again, giving out grants and encouraging scientists to conduct criminological research. Uh, these, I only mention these two organizations because you might see that peppered throughout our course readings or other things I direct you toward, and I want you to know what those are. Those are organizations that produce research, right, that maybe they would put on the internet that you could look up in those things that we may commonly call research but aren't actually research. Now, a major principle in criminology and sociology are that social forces cause people to behave in certain ways. That's really the basis of modern sociology, that there are elements within our society that cause you and me to uh, do certain things. Within criminology specifically, these forces take the form of age, race, maybe living situations, levels of education, and other personal and community characteristics. And of course, age, race, living situation, those impact people in outside of criminology, in other realms of sociology. But these are, these are factors that we take into scientific consideration when looking at criminal justice programs, right? So even if you don't wind up being a professional criminologist, um, you as someone who is involved in criminal justice might 
uh, be interested in knowing about these specific factors. And even if you're not involved in criminal justice as your career, uh, to understand the news, to understand public policy better as a well-informed citizen, you should know about these things. So um, when we're talking about these social forces, uh, a good example are types of offenders, of types of people who break the law. Uh, we can break them up in terms of age in three categories. We have adolescent limited offenders, we have life course persistent offenders, and then we also have career criminals. Adolescent limited offenders are people who only commit crime during their teens and in their early 20s. And if you look at the crime statistics, the vast majority of people who do commit crime and uh, of those who are caught, the vast majority are adolescent limited offenders, right? It's the dumb things we do when we're young, right? Um, that's most criminals. Life course persistent offenders then are people who commit crimes throughout their life. Um, and that is the minority of uh, people who commit crimes. Uh, and then within that circle of the Venn diagram, we would have career criminals. Career criminals are a small percentage of all people who break the law, and these people then are the ones who commit the majority of crime, right? So we have a very small percentage that does most of the crime in our society. Sure, we all know someone or we are someone who did some things when we were young and stupid, but that doesn't necessarily make us a criminal right, the way society sees it. Uh, and this breakdown of three types of offenders is really critical for the study of criminology because it's really critical for understanding the types of offenders that we're dealing with um, and the types of maybe determining the policy that uh, is present in the criminal justice system. If you know that a teenager with a small portion of marijuana uh, ha has only a small portion of marijuana, that person should be treated differently than someone in their 40s with a massive amount of uh, cocaine, for example, if we're talking about drug policy. Uh, that is uh, an idea that those two people should be treated differently. That's an idea that's relatively common in our society now. Um, and a lot of that is based off the concept that that uh, kid with a little bit of weed in their pocket is an adolescent limited offender uh, and in many parts of the country isn't even an offender anymore. So age is a factor. There are other factors, but um, age is one of them. And factors can be either protective factors or risk factors. We commonly talk about risk factors. We don't often talk about protective factors. Protective factors are elements of an individual's identity that make crime less likely. Uh, and then within protective factors, we have collective eff efficacy. Sorry, that word snuck up on me. It's efficacy, things that are effective. Uh, it, Collective efficacy is a high degree of stability and connectedness that is present in some communities that determines, determines crime. So certain uh, community organizations or presence of community organizations, these could be churches, these could be clubs, these could be any number of religious organizations or community organizations. These groups um, are can be protective factors and they create a collective efficacy by really binding the community together. And those elements then diminish the risk of crime. Risk factors then are personal characteristics that make an individual more prone to commit crime. And that can create, create concentrated disadvantage. Uh, concentrated disadvantage exists in communities that enhance the possibility of deviance or criminality. So if you are living in a community uh, with a high degree of poverty that has a very poor relationship for one reason or another with police, uh, maybe a community with a very, very 
uh, high uh, rate of uh, mortality, for example, uh, this could create risk factors that could encourage young people uh, to uh, really not respect law enforcement, could uh, cause uh, young people to not really care about what the law is. And those sorts of attitudes then can lead to um, higher chances that young people could commit crimes and be caught and uh, be labeled. Uh, we'll talk about labeling theory later in the course. Uh, but those are risk factors, right? So we've talked a little bit about research then. Uh, let's talk about what happens when research gets political because uh, that can cause things to get unscientific. Politicians on both sides, right? So both Democrats, Republicans, and other kinds of politicians, they love to pretend to use science but they only use it when it backs up their points they're trying to make, right? And that's not how science works. And this is another major problem we have in our society is people using data only when it is convenient for them. And because people are only using data when it's convenient to them and not talking about the flaws in our data, this has led us to believe or have the feeling that, well, if someone says one thing, there has to be another side to the story. And the reality of the matter is that from a scientific perspective, there either is reality or there isn't, right? That's really at the basis of a lot of scientific thinking. Either, either I am living or I am dead, right? There are no two sides to truth, at least in the strictest scientific. We're ta ta talking about metaphysics. We're not talking about personal philosophy. We are talking about existence, right? And, but truth is often nuanced, right? You, if you don't necessarily know what I mean by nuance, there are shades of gray in between. When I said either I am living or I am not, I am saying that either I, Jeremy Baker, my heart is beating now and I uh, have functioning organs and I'm walking around in the world. That's what I mean by living. Well, there could be some nuance there, right? Um, at the t this is getting a little bit grim, but you know, at the time of this recording, I'm living, right? I could very well be dead right now by the time that you're listening to it. Uh, this is getting heavy. Um, or I could be in a coma. Is that living? I could be brain dead. Is that living, right? There are certain philosophical stages between living and not living. Um, and there is certainly nuance to that, right? And science, truth can be nuanced, but the simple fact of the matter is that I am now more living if I am in a coma than say Benjamin Franklin is, who is dust right now, right? That is truth, right? And that is scientific truth. So what I'm getting at is that we have corrupted science in our society to a point where it's easy. A lot of people sometimes say, well, there's two, two sides to every story. That's not, that's not true. There, there is truth, right? Global warming exists, period, right? Um, that's scientific truth, and you can't argue scientific truth. This is a science course. That's not an opinion course. Science is con concerned with truth, and the truth is that the criminal justice system is broken in many ways. And those are what we're going to talk about, right? We're going to talk about some real tough things. And I am not just making up my opinion about things. And I don't, and you shouldn't either just make up your opinions about how the criminal justice system works and who should be punished and how they should be punished, right? We shouldn't do that. That's, not, that's unscientific. Uh, but if you don't like something in the criminal justice system, don't pretend it doesn't exist, please. Uh, if you really strongly don't like something, 
um, try to do something to change it, right? Uh, and that's something we run into in social science. And it's especially, it can be something we run into uh, in this course as well. So the programs of the criminal justice system, unfortunately, this is one of the problems with the criminal justice system, are not always based on the same scientific footing. So we have some really, really popular programs within the criminal justice system that are not backed with science. Uh, so to restate, a theory is absolutely solid science. It's a fact. It's a law. A hypothesis is an idea about how something could work. And then we have this an, an idea of folk knowledge. Folk knowledge is an idea that seems to make sense, but doesn't have scientific research to back it. Folk knowledge is often accepted as fact. And that is a problem. Uh, it is folk knowledge that uh, the D.A.R.E. program works, for example. Uh, we, it's a very pro popular program. It puts police in front of uh, children, and those police explain how drugs work and not to do drugs. And many people believe that that's a good thing, so therefore it must be effective, right? Because we like, we want it to work. The folk knowledge about how to prevent people from using drugs is that you have a D.A.R.E. program and drug use rates will go down. That's simply not true. There have been rigorous scientific studies to show that D.A.R.E. doesn't prevent drug use. It might prevent or it might cause police to have better relationships in the community, but it doesn't prevent drug use. And that's just one example. We'll talk more about D.A.R.E. Uh, in coming lectures. Now, when scientifically backed programs don't work though, because there are many scientifically backed programs that don't work, it is because they are having problems with what we call program fidelity. Program fidelity is implementation of a program in the way that researchers intend it to be implemented. So basically, if a program is working the way it's supposed to be working, that is program fidelity. Uh, let's use on some root work root words to try to plug this into your brain. Uh, if you cheat on your spouse, that's called infidelity, right? Not being faithful. Well, program fidelity is faithfulness to how the program should work. So those charged with impl implementing programs, so police, prison guards, other officials, have been known to sabotage either intentionally or unintentionally because we do make mistakes as people, but also there are people that make mistakes on purpose if the program does not match with your folk knowledge of what you hold as being true. And this can lead to the failure of a program. So for example, if prison guards do not allow prisoners to study, education programs in the prison cannot succeed because the students who are the prisoners won't be able to study to get their grades up, right? So if prison guards believe that prisoners should not, haven't earned the right to learn, then they will not be able to learn, right? Because the prison guards are keeping student, those students away from their books. And then they will not be able to improve. And when they don't improve and they don't get their education when they are, uh, incarcerated and they get out having not gotten that education then they turn back to crime then they get back in prison and that whole system has nothing to do with trying to educate people right it does not disprove that if you are able to educate inmates, then they have a lesser chance of recidivism, which is our hypothesis we were working with there that I should have said five minutes ago. Um, that's a problem with program fidelity is what I'm getting. Um, and that's a big idea. And that's an idea we'll come back to over and over. That's a big one, so pay attention to that for studying. Um, okay, that is the end of this lecture. We will be going into in the next lecture on what programs work and what programs don't. Um, if you were a little surprised that I was talking about D.A.R.E. as a program that didn't work because people think that it does work, uh, you'll be uh, learning more about that in the next lecture. Okay, thank you so much for listening to this, and I uh, hope 
you will be listening to me again soon.